as you all know, the instance of peptic ulcers has diminished since the introduction of proton pump inhibitors. Yet we continue to see complicated peptic ulcers with bleeding, perforations, non-healing ulcers and strictures not infrequently. The surgical treatment for complicated ulcers has evolved also. Open techniques are utilized infrequently and MIS is utilized on a regular basis for elective as well as emergent operations. Endoscopic therapies have revolutionized how we take care of these patients. We have a fantastic panel of speakers today who will talk about the entire spectrum of peptic ulcer disease. We will take as many questions as possible after the presentations at the very end. I want to thank all the faculty who have generously agreed to participate and for their time and expertise. I would also like to thank Steve Lamb from Cleveland Clinic and Vanessa Chang from Sages, without whom these webinars would not be possible. Before we get started, I would encourage all of you to register for the Sages meeting in Cleveland. It's going to be a great meeting, and I'm especially excited about the, about the Friday night sing-off that's going to take place in the iconic Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Some more housekeeping points before we start. The program is being recorded and is going to be available on sages.org in a few weeks. If you want to ask questions or interact with the faculty, please use the chat pod to type down all your questions. If you do experience technical problems during the webinar, exit the room, close the window, and rejoin. This will typically take care of the issue. If the issue persists, please let, let us know via the chat pod, and our technicians will get in touch with you to resolve the issue. So without further ado, so we can take as many questions as possible towards the end, let's get started. Our first speaker is Dr. Julianne Bingner. Dr. Bingner is a professor of surgery at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Her interests include minimal invasive surgery, robotics, and surgical endoscopy. Dr. Bingner is going to set the stage for the current state of affairs as it relates to peptic ulcer disease and show how it has evolved over the last few years. Thank you, Dr. Bingner. Thank you so much, Rashir, and uh, welcome, everybody. We're glad that you could join us. Um, it's a fantastic webinar. So I will set the stage a little bit and talk about incidents of peptic ulcer disease now, indications for an operation, both elective and emergent, some of the management of non-healing ulcers, as well as some post-gastrectomy syndromes. I will not go into all of these in detail. I will touch on them because the biggest interest is usually in how to actually do it. So peptic ulcer disease as a whole is a relatively young disease. Um, gastric cancer was known at the time of Hippocrates, but gastric ulcer is younger than that. However, lifetime general population prevalence is about 5 to 10 percent. The incidence is about 1 to 3 in 1,000 per year and 10 to 20% of those people will have complications. Perforations will lead to about 40% of ulcer-related death, unfortunately. And you can see the uh, presentation frequency is most often with bleeding, much less frequently with perforation, and only sometimes with obstruction nowadays. Peptic ulcer disease also depends on its prevalence and presentation and disability on where you are when you get the ulcer. So if you are a person in a highly developed country, the likelihood of having life years with disability or death from peptic ulcer is fairly low. However, if you are in a country with a less developed economy and a less developed health system, your likelihood of having actually experienced with a peptic ulcer that leads to disability or death is much higher. That may also be true for differently developed areas within countries. It's something to keep in mind as we plan strategy for treatment. Peptic ulcer disease, as Dr. Puri has said, has changed significantly over time. And um, in 1980, the colleagues that I learned from essentially had half of the ulcers that presented to them for intractability some for perforation, obstruction, and bleeding. Peptic ulcer operations were as frequently as gallbladder operations. 
that was before we had PPIs and H2 blockers. Over time, operations for peptic ulcer disease have decreased significantly. It's now a rare thing to have an elective operation for a peptic ulcer, um, but truly the emergent operations are not gone. The patients change a little bit too. In lower developed countries, the age of presenting with ulcer disease is younger in their 40s, and that used to be like that in the United States as well. Now, patients more often present in their 60s in high developed countries. And more often, pep uh, peptic ulcer disease is related to medication rather than to just H. pylori. So many of the patients who present have been treated with non-steroidal pain medications, with steroids, or with chemotherapy. That changed quite a bit in how these patients present and who presents with it. Indications for surgery today on a divided by emergent and elective. Emergent perforation and bleeding are the two leading things. Elective surgery for gastric also may be a gastric outlet obstruction. Intractability, although that's very, very rare. And then the concern for neoplasia, if that can't be ruled out. Now, complicated peptic ulcer disease are the ones with um, either bleeding, perforation, or an obstruction. There's about 150,000 admissions in the United States, maybe even less now. Out of those, 10% are perforations, and that is the single most important contributor to inpatient death from peptic ulcer disease, much more so than bleeding. So if you have a bleeding peptic ulcer, you have multiple decisions to make. One of them, if your patient's unstable, then you, you may very well have to consider emergent surgery to oversew it or excise the ulcer, depending on what exactly it is. If your patient is stable, then, thanks to our colleagues in endoscopy, we have different options. We can assess the ulcer and see if it's low risk for rebleeding. If, it, if so, endoscopy and medical therapy alone may be quite enough for treatment. And often will be. However, if the ulcer is at high risk for the bleeding, then you have to think about what is the operative risk of the patient. Is it somebody with a high operative risk, and would you prefer just to proceed with endoscopic and medical management because you think that the likelihood of survival with an, a surgical procedure is very low? That is certainly something to consider. The other question is if you have a patient with a low operative risk, and then at what time should you consider operating? The reason for that consideration is the increasing mortality risk with ongoing time and ongoing need for transfusion in a bleeding ulcer patient. So if the patient gets transfused one unit of blood and is stable now, that's not necessarily an indication for an emergent surgical operation or even a, a planned urgent surgical procedure. But if the patient continues to bleed, with each transfusion, the risk of mortality goes up and the success of endoscopy goes down. So there may be a sweet spot in between those times when trying to repeat endoscopy may be less helpful than actually deciding to go to surgical procedure. That changes depending on which place you are at. If you have a, a very, very experienced endoscopy team that is available at any time, you may make your decision differently than if you have nobody available or a less experienced team. Now, as I said, the uh, decision tree for perforated peptic ulcer is probably a little different than for bleeding peptic ulcer because the likelihood of dying from it is so much higher. It presents about 5% of all abdominal emergencies, over 70% of uh, also related death in hospital, up to one in four or five person dies from a peptic ulcer when it's perforated. Many of the elderly people have medication related perforations. And after a year, one in three people unfortunately does not survive a perforated peptic ulcer. Things to consider for perforated peptic ulcer management. If you have a suspected perforated ulcer, one of the things you want to find out is if it's a 
steel perforation or it's a pre perforation. The other question is again, what kind of surgical risk is your patient? Is it somebody who is high risk um, for any kind of surgery and may not survive a surgical procedure? Or is it somebody who's high risk if you do not operate on the patient? If you have somebody who has a documented steel perforation or somebody who is a high surgical risk and um, you may go to a non-operative management, if you have a patient who has a perforation because they have had chemotherapy and advanced directive, maybe then no operative management would be adequate. If you, however, don't have a sealed perforation or somebody that you don't think is going to do well with a non-operative treatment, then you should consider operative management. Laparoscopic repair is appropriate if you not, don't have a hostile abdomen that you know about. If you have adequate laparoscopic training, nobody's bleeding at the same time, and you don't have a contraindication for pneumoperitoneum. So a patient who is presenting with a blood pH of 6.94 or so but may not be a good candidate. So more about non-operative treatment. Who are the candidates? So somebody who has quite normal vital signs, they are stable, has no free leak of contrast on the water-soluble study, and has no peritonitis or sepsis. That is, at the moment, at this time, considered one of the people who could do well with that. People who are less likely to, well, to do well are people who are over 70 years old, who have a large pneumoperitoneum, are tachycardic and have distended bowel loops, which likely will represent contamination. Here's an example of a, a patient we treated a couple of weeks ago uh, with not directly a straightforward peptic ulcer, but somebody with a known marginal ulcer, a 30 year old lady uh, who had a UNY gastric bypass may not have been taken her medication or pay, and so it suddenly had increased pain, had normal heart rate, normal blood pressure, had a white blood cell count initially of 13, that then rapidly improved to 9. She did not undergo an operation. She underwent endoscopic treatment with an overstitch and did fine with that. And you can see on the image the small contained perforation there. What are other indications for operative therapy other than bleeding and perforation? One of them could be gastric, gastric outlet obstruction. Gastric outlet obstruction may be present in a patient who, who presents with persistent nausea and vomiting, with weight loss, retained food on endoscopy, and may not have had but it may have had a dilation that was not successful. If that's the case, operative intervention should be considered. Here's one such patient I saw a few weeks ago, a 78-year-old lady. She had lots of hip pain, could barely walk um, until she could get in to be seen by an orthopedic surgeon. She had taken a lot of ibuprofen. And so she underwent surgery for her hip and soon thereafter started losing weight because she couldn't eat anymore. And on endoscopy, she was found to have a very tight stricture as you can see here, she had food retained in her stomach, and on CT imaging, you can see the inflammatory changes around her pylorus. So she was referred for um, consideration of surgical management for her gastric outlet obstruction. Fortunately, in the meantime, this lady actually had stopped taking her NSAIDs because now after the hip surgery, while she had lost weight, she had no, no longer any pain. So her ulcer started actually to heal she underwent a dilation and um, was doing fine thereafter, so we actually did not operate on this uh, lady. Other considerations for operative therapy in somebody with a gastric outlet obstruction is if you are suspicious that they may not have just a benign ulcer, but they may have an adenocarcinoma, meaning if a dilation and stopping the NSAIDs don't help and you continue to have the obstruction, other than adenocarcinoma, lymphoma, melanoma, or other malignancies could also be involved. Very, very rarely, I would say nowadays, is disabling pain from a non-healing ulcer despite medical um, therapy and smoking. So 
but that might be also an indication for somebody to undergo a medical procedure. So if somebody presents with a non-healing ulcer, what are the things that we think of? We have learned a lot about the medication, both in what kind of medication may be effective, and in, in dosing and compliance with that. One of the patients I remember I have seen before, it was referred to me for non-healing ulcer, had been endoscoped, I think, four times in three months increments with increasing doses of um, PPI, biopsies, all were benign. So the prescription had been written. The patient, however, was Spanish-speaking only, and none of the treating physicians spoke Spanish. And it had gotten lost in translation, and he was actually to take the medication. And so over all that time, he didn't have he didn't take the medication because he didn't know he had to take it. And once he finally understood that he needed to take the medication, the, med the, the ulcer healed. So things like that may play a role in non-healing ulcers. There may be some social factors. Um, the question is always if H. pylori was truly eradicated or if there's a resistant strain. One of the things we've also learned that there are some patients who are fast or ultra-fast metabolizers of PPI, which have to have a whole different dosing regimen and may not respond to a normal prescription for PPI. Other considerations, of course, are things like gastrin secretions all under Ellison syndrome, or unusual ulcer causes, such things as TB, eosinophilic gastroenteritis, lymphoma, metaplasia, neoplasia, or even eczema. All of those sources then should be taken care of in order to help the ulcer heal. Switching gear now to from before surgical treatment to after uh, surgical treatment talking a little bit about the post gastrectomy syndromes. After we have surgically approached an ulcer, what are the things that can happen, or what are the things to discuss if you're considering with a patient to decide for an ulcer surgery? One of the things I find patients are quite interested in are the dumping problems, both the early and the late dumping. As one of my patients told me, the barbecued ribs went fine, but the blueberry pie was terrible. That's how easily to remember that any kind of sugars, of course, may make the patient quite miserable, either with early dumping, with nausea and vomiting, and fatigue over the late dumping. First line of therapy for that um, is diet change, meaning having more complex carbohydrates, avoiding the fast sugars, including sodas and things like that. Second line approach may be you have dumping to go to a who and why, but that's indeed a second line approach. You may still have some dumping. Post vagotomy diarrhea and dysmotility often can also be helped by diet change. I found some mention of an antiperistaltic jejunal segment um, from some time ago. I've never actually seen that done. I just wanted to include it here for completeness sake. The late gastric emptying is another um, potential problem after we sever the electronic connection between um, the different parts of the GI tract. Prokinetic medication would be the first line therapy. Some patients, however, are so miserable that they require completion gastrectomy. That should probably not be the first line therapy, and we should thoroughly rule out that there's no other problems, no other obstructions before we proceed with that. Within the delayed gastric emptying, um, category, we can also possibly put the afferent loop syndrome, because it may also have something to do with emptying. And the question is then, when you have an afferent loop and you have a very dilated loop that is not working right, um, after, for example, a B2 or after a gastrodigenostomy, is there an obstruction? And why? Where is the obstruction? How can we improve that? If we can't um, solve the obstruction, we may have to convert whatever the patient had before to a run y procedure. The same is true for an efferent loop syndrome. So if there's a downstream obstruction, can we find that 
can we solve that either through endoscopy or through another surgical procedure? There's not really another option. Rustasis would be another um, possible syndrome. Completion gastrectomy with a RUNY is one of the possibilities, or feeding jejunostomy. Bile reflux gastritis is something that makes patients quite miserable. Medical therapy with polystyramine can be tried. Sometimes that works. Other options we have is converting that to a RUNY procedure, a brawn anastomosis, or jejunal interposition. And we want to show you a few examples of things that sometimes happen after uh, we have a surgical management of the gastric ulcer. This is a patient who underwent a gastrojejunostomy after um, gastric outlet obstruction because of ulcer disease. She actually happens to be a super fast metabolizer, and we did not recognize that early on. So she suffered from significant ulcer disease, had gastric outlet obstruction, was losing weight, underwent a retrocolic gastrojejunostomy, and also actually uh, a bilateral truncal vagotomy by somebody. Um, subsequently, because of her fast metabolism, metabolization of the TPI, she had a marginal ulcer. She also did have significant fiscal dysmotility which then led to significant distension of her small bowel and a marginal ulcer perforation. So she had a second surgery for her ulcers, uh, which was a cram patch at her previous anastomosis. As soon as she was healed and had recovered from that, unfortunately, she started experiencing pain with eating, colicky pain every time she eats something. And then subsequently, the uh, imaging studies, we could see um, the significantly distended duodenal lymph. You see this contrast going into the stomach. You see she still has some flow through the gastric outlet obstruction. And then here's her anastomosis. The anastomosis is widely patent, but this limb certainly is very large, and every time she eats, she has significant pain and complaints to lose weight. So for her, the obstruction happened after the gland patch was pl was placed in something and the anatomy of this afferent limb changed. Um, we'll be taking her back to the operating room soon and hopefully we can solve her obstruction. Other post-operative problems are, of course, um, strictures, anastomotic strictures. One of them you see here, marginal ulcers we have talked about. Um, that's certainly a frequently seen problem in the bariatric environment. A third thing that I did not um, read much about, but I've recently had several patients that are treated with that, um, is due to the significantly distorted anatomy, for example, after Bill Roth II. Patients get a significantly distorted biliary anatomy 20 years or 25 years out from um, a Bill Roth II. Sometimes that leads to a significant cholestasis and massively dilated gallbladders. Um, on the bottom here is a picture of a papilla. Our um, super experienced gastroenterologist um, was asked to do the ERCP. He said she must have had a, um, a cholodocal regionostomy because that doesn't look like the normal papilla anymore. She did not. She had never had surgery on the right side of her body. It was just distorted uh, biliary anatomy, which was long term after. So those are just some of the uh, outlines what, hap what can happen before and after um, the surgery for gastric ulcer. I um, will let the people who will explain how to do it. Um, the next uh, few talks. Um, I will now uh, move to Dr. Patilazade from Cleveland Clinic. Uh, she is an assistant professor of surgery um, and sh her interest is minimally invasive surgery and advanced therapeutic endoscopy. And she's gonna talk about endoscopic uh, 
um, an operative management of uh, strictures as well as gastric outlet obstruction. And as you uh, are all aware, the, the pendulum is swinging slowly but steadily towards endoscopic and minimally invasive techniques. So with that, uh, I'll hand it over. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, uh, Dr. Perry, for that introduction and Dr. Bingner for that excellent um, introductory talk. I'll just kind of piggyback on that and um, we're kind of skipping ahead and we're going to start with the actual endoscopic management of perforations and gastric outlet obstruction. I have no disclosures. Um, these first two slides just kind of highlight the, <clears throat> the various different topics underlying perforations uh, and leaks as well as gastric outlet obstruction and at the end I'm just going to touch base um, feeding access. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just recovering from a cold. Um, feeding access, which is relevant to gastric outlet obstruction as well. As just a general overview, when, when handling perforations endoscopically, um, overall, if a smaller, for smaller defects that are more acute, clips can be used to manage those perforations. For slightly larger defects or those that tend to be more chronic in nature, other modalities such as stents or internal drains or even endoscopic vac therapy may be preferable. And the next few algorithms essentially outline this. This is one um, regarding gastric, acute gastric perforation, which demonstrates that smaller perforations can be better managed with clips, or um, this algorithm demonstrating that duodenal perforations, once again, smaller perforations can be managed with clips, whereas larger may be met, better managed with larger clips, like over the scope clips or covered stents. And for those that are more chronic in nature, <clears throat> or with uh, persistent anastomotic leaks or official present um, that stenting or endo uh, endoscopic vascular, excuse me, vac therapy may be a better option. And as Dr. Bingner mentioned as well, of course, if a patient is more septic, if there's a large non-contained leak or, it's, or if uh, there's non-viable tissue of the patient's acutely septic, then surgery may be a better initial option for treatment. <clears throat> Once again, for uh, endoscopic um, clip management. Um, basic two-prong or three-prong clips may be better for smaller defects that are less than one centimeter. Over-the-scope clips tend to span a larger defect and may be better for up to two centimeters. And the success rates are demonstrated here overall, just generally very good uh, successful closure rates when done in an acute setting with smaller defects. With over-the-scope um, of VESCO clips demonstrating an acute perforation success rate of about 89%. A little bit less for leaks, around 73%, and less so for fistulas due to that persistent connection. This picture just demonstrates different types of endoscopic clips. As you can see here, there are two prong clips as well as three prong, and the, um, they vary in the distance from the length of the clip itself as well as the jaw opening. And as is demonstrated in this picture here, you want to try to grasp both edges of the tissue to truly get a good closure of the perforation. The bottom picture is demonstrating an over-the-scope clip. Here, the technique is demonstrating a um, three-prong clip that's actually grabbing the tissue, the edges of the tissue, and pulling it into the clip. Another alternative, which I'll demonstrate in this next video, is um, using actual um, suction. So using the cap to suction the tissue and the hole into the uh, cap itself and, and closing it with the clip. So this is going to demonstrate, this video demonstrates how a Novesco clip is set up. <clears throat> First, you use the, um, the um, channel and essentially insert the plastic component of the Ovesco clip into the channel. Once that's set up, there's a Velcro piece that you actually wrap around the scope. Subsequently, followed by um, a, you can either use an endoscopic instrument or there's an endoscopic kind of puller that, that comes with the device that you pass through the channel and it pulls the actual cord all the way through, ultimately until you get just the cap at the end and you want to pull it and you wrap it around the plastic device. And once you're at the end, you secure the clip in place at the end of the endoscope and you want to try to line up the channel with the string and you slide the clip onto the end of the endoscope. And then when you're ready for the actual tissue, you can either use, so you're using, you can either insert a two or three prong clip, or you can use this section. So this is going to demonstrate using section to draw the tissue or the area of concern up into the clip, and then you deploy the clip. 
you want to be very precise with this because if it's not precise, the clip can actually ask or excuse me, act as a barrier to healing of the wound itself. The next uh, endoscopic modality that we're going to talk about is endoscopic suturing, which uh, Dr. Bingner alluded to. Generally, um, this is used for full thickness sutures. It tends to be overall very effective. However, it tends to be used for larger and more complex closures. So I think that's a large um, reason to attribute for the high fistula reopening rate. These images demonstrate how an Apollo overstitch is loaded. I'm actually going to play a video to demonstrate this. So I'm just going to kind of click through the video so that you can see. So initially, there's an anchor that's deployed <clears throat> that has the stitch on it, and you pull the anchor back that allows the stitch to loop. And then the actual base of the needle comes down, and it um, essentially loads the suture itself. And then after that is hooked into place, you push one of the blue buttons, and it, and it, it clips into place. And the endoscopic um, suture is then pulled up and it's ready to deploy. <clears throat> There's then a helical device that you use and insert into the tissue and it coils into the tissue, um, allowing you to get a good piece of, of tissue and essentially pull it into your device so that you can get a full thickness grasp with the, um, as is demonstrated here, the Apollo overstitch. So the tissue is pulled into the jaw, and you then deploy your suture through it. <coughs> and then you reload afterwards. Only once you're done suturing do you actually completely um, deploy the, the suture. And then a knot pusher device is used to actually to cinch the knot down. One of my favorite endoscopic modalities for treatment of contained abscesses, and I'm kind of um, lumping perforations and leaks together, is a internal pigtail drain. So with this modality, what you do is you actually go in endoscopically and identify the abscess cavity as is seen here. And generally, I'll go in with a, um, a gentle wire, like a biliary wire, and under fluoroscopy, watch it coil into the actual uh, cavity. And then it's passed with a with this double pigtail stent actually goes into the channel of a therapeutic endoscope, followed by a pusher. You essentially push it under fluoroscopy um, and, and visualization with the endoscope directly into the cavity. And this is kind of a belts and suspenders approach. Frequently, we'll use multiple modalities, so um, an pig, internal pigtail in addition to a, um, a stent, which we'll talk about later. It can also be used in isolation. Um, and general rule of thumb is it's better to use I've, I haven't done multiple drains yet, but in very large cavities, um, it's better to use like two separate seven French drains, for example, rather than a single 10 French drain. It allows for better drainage. Another potential option for treating uh, abscess cavities is a septotomy. These top images here are demonstrating a Zenker's diverticulum, which is not exactly what we're talking about, but I feel like the pictures um, provide a good demonstration of a septotomy. So the bottom picture does demonstrate an abscess cavity here and the actual um, main lumen here. And if you have a clear bridge in between the two areas, you can actually take a TT knife and just come across and divide that bridge. Occasionally, it can be a little scary because you don't know your limit. So occasionally, this might require um, two to three sessions and um, repeat endoscopies. Um, versus, you know, if you're a little bit more uh, sure, a little bit more confident, you can try to address it in uh, one setting. I'm going to actually skip that video um, and move on. So this next video, or excuse me, this next topic is endoscopic vac therapy, which is quite, quite interesting also and quite effective. Um, generally, the steps of this, you want to first assess the cavity size. The downside for this procedure is that generally the patient ends up staying inpatient because the vac has to be exchanged every two to three days like it would for a normal um, wound vac. And, and on average, it requires generally about five to seven procedures for the patient's um, wound to heal, depending on, of course, the size of the tract itself. The presence of a fistulous tract can actually 
um, inhibit the healing of this wound. So if you've got a fistula to the colon, for example, that persistent fistula's connection can make it quite difficult for this defect to ever close. And it has been demonstrated to have very high success rates. It's generally used um, when tissues are a little bit more questionable or a little bit more um, concerning um, when other modalities may or may not be applicable. So we go in with an endoscope, identify the cavity, irrigate it out, um, pass, a, pass an NG tube through the nose and out of the mouth, and then secure the vac sponge onto the NG tube, um, making sure that all the holes are included and then it's passed into the abscess cavity. And I'll, then, I'll show this um, in the following video. These images demonstrate the initial abscess cavity and after treatment with a endoscopic back therapy demonstrating good granulation tissue and ultimate healing of this cavity. <clears throat> this video demonstrates um, how this procedure is actually done. So you take the NG tube, apply the, apply the black sponge, um, secure it in place. And then it's actually pulled, um, that was pulled, put from the nose and pulled out of the mouth and the black sponge is applied and then it's passed into the abscess cavity. And this is demonstrating it actually being um, placed endoscopically into the identified cavity. It can be a little bit tricky because the, the presence of the sponge itself obviously obstructs your view a little bit. Um, and this is falling down the cavity, so you see the vac actually in the defect. And then when you go to take it out subsequently, you can actually irrigate through that NG tube um, in order to flush it out and pull it straight out, or you can pull it out under endo endoscopic visualization. And I'm going to show you the um, complete um, resolution of this as is demonstrated here. It granulates quite nicely and is quite effective. All right, so we're going to change course a little bit and talk about gastric outlet obstruction and the management of gastric outlet obstruction, benign and malignant. <clears throat> In regards to dilators, there are two different main types of dilators, mechanical or balloon. Mechanical tend to um, exert a longitudinal as well as a radial force, whereas balloon dilators tend to exert a radial force along the whole stricture. And they can be through the scope or over the wire. Generally, you want to first estimate the size of the narrowing. Um, some mechanical dilators will be passed without a wire, will be passed blindly. For example, in bougies, when we do a bougie over scope, um, can be also used for dilating purposes, or through the scope balloons, can go through the channel of the scope. General rule of thumb is you don't want to go um, more than, you don't want to do more than three um, size dilators and ap apply each one about 30 to 60 seconds. So more than, so no increase more than about six French or two millimeters over the span of two balloons. <clears throat> this image just demonstrates different types of dilators, savory dilator, a Maloney dilator in the top right, as well as a balloon dilation in the bottom. When we perform balloon dilations, this is your area of stricture, um, do the balloon dilation and then you want to do this under direct endoscopic visualization. So you actually apply the balloon dilator and you have to hold it quite taut because the balloon can want to um, kind of pull your scope either in or push back. And you, once you find a good happy spot, um, hold the balloon dilator in place, hold it for 30 seconds to a minute and actually push your scope against it. So you can see this white ring here, which is the area of stricture that you're actually trying to dilate. And close um, evaluation of this can also help you identify any full thickness perforation. So if you see this, turn into a big big um, black opening that can be a little bit concerning for full thickness perforation. We're going to talk about stents as well, which can actually be applied to um, perforation, treatment of perforations as well as gastric outlet obstruction. There are different types of stents, both fully and partially covered. Um, generally, you want the tissue that you're using to be viable and the defects to be generally less than three centimeters. You take into consideration that if you're stenting an area like the GE junction, it can put patients at very high risk of uh, bad reflux or aspiration. So you want to take that into consideration in regards to whether or not you keep them intubated, for example. Um, and if you're stenting over a defect that has a large abscess cavity, you may need additional drain source control, either with an internal drain, as was demonstrated earlier, or with an external like IR drain. One of the main points of consideration with, with stent placement is that migration can play a large role um, in up to like 
anecdotally, you know, one about 25%, I think, is, is what the literature demonstrates, and anecdotally, sometimes more. Um, some people will apply clips or stents or sutures to hold the stent in place. None of it has actually really been demonstrated to make much of a difference, but everybody has their own technique and how they do it. Um, I tend to do it for uh, more esophageal or GE junction ones because they tend to, in my limited experience, they tend to migrate more frequently. You want to try to obtain four centimeter margins um, proximally and distally. Depending on if you can actually pass the st stenosis with the scope or not de determines what type of wire you use. If you're able to pass the stenosis, you'll use a heavier wire um, because you can actually directly visualize where that stiff wire is going. Whereas if your scope can't pass the lesion, you'll generally use a biliary wire under fluoroscopy because biliary wire is nice and um, soft and bends easily at the tip. And you want to pass the wire approximately 20 centimeters distal to the obstruction. This is just demonstrating a scope. Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes it requires a dilation prior to placement of a, of a stent. And this is demonstrating the esophageal stent placement. <clears throat> this is a quick video. So in this video, the stent is placed past the area of obstruction, generally following a, a potential dilation. And the stent is um, deployed it can actually be partially deployed and then it can be resheathed and then redeployed if you um, feel like your stent is not in a good spot. So there's a point of no return after which you cannot resheath it. Um, I tend to um, err on the side of the stent being a little bit more distal rather than proximal because it's easier to pull the stent physically back than it is to drag it downward. And then this is just demonstrating the stent finally being deployed. Um, sometimes it can take up to 24 to 48 hours for the stent to, to fully expand into the cavity. And then after the stent is fully deployed, we'll usually follow up with a, um, with a endoscopic, uh, or excuse me, with a fluoroscopic follow-up to evaluate for any leak. I kind of group these two categories together. Another potential option is a strictioplasty. Um, stricturoplasty essentially involves, if you visualize the actual air stricturing, you can actually take a TT knife and just divide it directly. Another method of doing that is in a tunneled manner, which is very similar to how we do our peroral pyloromyotomies, which is why I use those images here. So when we do a peroral pyloromyotomy or tunneled stricturoplasty, you um, inject and create a blood, then divide with a knife, go down to the area of either the pylorus muscle or the air stricture divide it with the knife, and then come out of your tunnel and close the defect. And this video demonstrates um, the example of the stricturoplasty. So it, it's injection, injected, you create a submucosal blood, divide with the endoscopic knife, then actually go through the tunnel and divide the stricture. And the Either you can divide the stricture directly without creating a tunnel, the downside being if you create a full thickness perforation, it's more difficult um, or it could potentially be a, a little bit more difficult to get a complete closure, whereas if you have the tunnel, the tunnel is protective. So once this is completed, you pull out of the tunnel and you can actually close the tunnel with sutures or clips, whatever your preferred modality is. One other uh, few other points to just kind of touch upon in terms of newer technology um, for gastric outlet obstruction, occasionally for patients for, for a bad malignant disease um, who may not be good surgical candidates. For example, lumen opposing stents may be used, um, and this endo, uh, endoscopic ultrasound is used to identify the adjacent um, structure um, or limb of bowel to create a um, GJ anastomosis with a lumen opposing metal stent such as this one, such as an Axios. And then endoscopic treatment for palliation for people with uh, esophageal or gastric carcinomas. These are some different um, modalities that can also be employed endoscopically. And it's, of course, it's uh, important to just kind of put a plug in for feeding access for anybody who's dealing with chronic um, gastric outlet obstruction who have a component of malnutrition. There's also um, it should not be forgotten that feeding access is obviously crucial, and I know everybody's quite familiar with this, but we'll just kind of go through the basic video and steps of um, a 
peg tube. So one to one in terms of your finger indentation and then passing a needle under direct endoscopic visualization. Once the needle and the catheter are in, you pass a wire and the wire is, um, is uh, looped. The wire is then pulled ultimately out of the mouth and then it's looped onto the gastrostomy tube itself and then pulled back into the stomach. The other common endoscopic modality for doing this is the uh, push method, which would entail placing teeth fasteners and then um, actually pushing with a large catheter and sheath, breaking the sheath and passing the gastrostomy tube that way. So this is the gastrostomy tube being pulled down and then pulled out of the stomach against the abdominal wall, and then you can divide it and place your fastener down. And that's it. Thank you for your time and attention. Two questions for you. Um, as far as the Apollo overstitch goes, where do you see, like, where do you use it? For what kind of perforations? So I would use it for larger, generally full thickness defects. Um, when you have good viable tissue. We also employ it for other non-perforation um, purposes, such as for like stomal revisions um, or endoscopic sleeves, um, which we, have, we haven't done too much, but that's also a different application for it. So I would do it when you've got good viable tissue and generally for larger defects. And I think it tends to be more effective in the, as with any um, perforation closure in the acute setting. Okay. Great, thanks. I have another question, but I'll, I'll try to get to it later once we get to the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you, Allison. Um, all right, I would like to thank Dr. Eleanor Fung for joining us. She just uh, got out of the OR and she just ran to make it on time. Um, she was supposed to go a little bit earlier, but again, uh, she had to do an emergency add-on case, so we appreciate her making it back on time. Um, Dr. Fung is an assistant professor of surgery at uh, University of Buffalo. Her interests include minimally invasive surgery as well as therapeutic and advanced endoscopy. And Dr. Fung is going to talk to us about uh, some endoscopic technology and the management of uh, bleeding peptic ulcers. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Um, Fung. Hi, how are you? I hope everyone uh, is having a good time so far. Um, all right, so we're just going to go through um, the role of endoscopy in the bleeding peptic ulcer. Um, I have a few disclosures, but none are really truly relevant. Um, so in terms of the objectives of this talk, we're really going to go over um, the endoscopic technology that's available for the management of GI bleeding, particularly for peptic ulcer disease, um, and how we apply that and how we actually do all of these uh, different endoscopic technologies and what the pros and cons of each one is and what the complications can um, happen um, with them. So in terms of the important considerations, I'm sure some of them have already been gone through, but essentially it's really good to be prepared before your, um, before your case. So whenever you have a GI bleed, it's very important to have all your different modalities available so you're prepared for any type of um, bleed and also have all the different types of uh, clips, um, energy devices and scopes available. We're going to go through all the equipment that you should have in the room with you. Um, it's very important to be comfortable in using all the technology, um, and that's why endoscopy is a really a key portion um, to everyone's uh, practice in general surgery. Um, it's important to know the anatomy and etiology for this is specific to uh, peptic ulcer disease. And really, um, for GI bleeding, the multidisciplinary approach is best. So it's not only being comfortable in the GI suite, but also having your OR and uh, OR ready as well as being um, also having your interventional radiology uh, colleagues available as if, uh, if it fails, um, it's, it's, in, um, it's in your best interest to have interventional radiology available for angioembolization. So in terms of that, um, endoscopy is actually quite effective in treating, um, in treating peptic ulcer disease. Um, it actually achieves hemostasis in greater than 90% of the cases, so that's why it's very important to be very comfortable with all these tech different techniques. So in terms of preparation, um, just like any other patient that's unstable, you want to have good IV access 
You want to be able to resuscitate the patient and have blood available. Uh, specific to peptic ulcer disease, um, you do want to give IV PPIs and not an H2 antagonist. Um, you want to give an 80 milligram IV load, and it's actually been proven that you can give a 40 milligram IV BID intermittent dosing, which is equally as effective as a continuous infusion. Um, in terms of other adjuncts, uh, prokinetics such as uh, erythromycin or reglin can help decrease the need for a second look endoscopy. And generally for peptic ulcer disease, doing it earlier rather than later is really recommended uh, after the patient is um, resuscitated as it's not only a diagnostic tool, but it's also a therapeutic tool. Um, NG tube lavage does, it does help in terms of making your diagnosis, so it does help to at least point you towards an upper source, uh, but it hasn't been actually shown to affect the ultimate outcomes afterwards. The other thing pertinent uh, to remember is really airway protection. Because you're dealing with an upper GI source, you're going through the uh, mouth, uh, you want to make sure that your airway is protected. Um, as the last thing you want in the middle of your case is the patient to deteriorate. Um, however, it has been shown that uh, if patients are endotracheally intubated, um, they have been associated with an adverse cardiopulmonary outcomes uh, with GI bleeds and in, in a case control study. So something to keep in mind, but it is important to um, make sure your airway is protected during these cases. So these are the things that you want to have um, in your uh, GI suite while you're dealing with an upper GI bleed. You want to have a larger caliber scope. Um, the regular gastroscope is good, uh, but the therapeutic gastroscope has a bigger instrument channel, and it also has a great bigger suctioning channel. So it is, has, um, has more suctioning power if, you have a, or if you're dealing with a lot of blood. Other things that you should have that's um, avail readily available is an injector needle. Um, you want to have epinephrine available. Um, you have different clips that you should have available through the scope ones are the ones that are most readily available um, that go through the instrument channel as opposed to the over the scope clip, but we're going to go through that. And then you want to have your energy devices also there. So there's different ones that we, we're going to talk about, the contact versus non-contact thermal devices, uh, whether it's argon, plasma, uh, coagulation, bipolar, hemostatic forceps, or the heater probe. But the heater probe is actually not available in the US, but uh, available elsewhere. Other adjuncts that are uh, useful to have in the room with you are things that help to evacuate clots, such as nets and snares, which are traditionally used for foreign body retrieval. Um, newer agents on the market are things that are topical hemostatic agents, such as hemospray, uh, fibrin glue, which we're all familiar with in the operating room. And other things that are a little bit le um, less, um, less conventional are things like the poly loop and um, endoscopic suturing, which we've already touched on already. So we're really, in terms of this, uh, I just wanted to go over the forest classification if it hasn't been gone through already. The ones on the left-hand side are the ones that are really um, most amenable to endoscopic uh, treatment, uh, ones with the visible vessels um, A and C, which are forest 1A and uh, 2A, uh, which have visible vessels which can easily be treated uh, with endoscopic treatment. B is one with active oozing but no visible vessel, and D is one with an adherent clot on the surface. The ones on the right with e and figures E and F are ones that are um, not ones that traditionally need any uh, endoscopic therapy and can be uh, treated conservatively. And this is just a general algorithm for um, dealing with a bleeding peptic ulcer. If you do have a suspicion for it, you want to first uh, assess the patient, stabilize them as we've already gone through, um, and give them IV PPIs. And once you do perform the endoscopy, um, as I mentioned, forest one and two are the ones that are really amenable to endoscopic treatment. And if it does fail, um, there is evidence to do a second attempt at endoscopy. Um, and then at that point, you really want to think about whether you should involve your interventional radiology colleagues for embolization or, and or think about the operating room. But uh, this is just a general algorithm for how to manage a bleeding peptic ulcer. So we're now we're going to go through the different endoscopic technologies that are available. The most readily available are um, Actually, first we're going to go through a clot evacuation. So this is uh, important to actually completely visualize the source of bleeding so that you can actually manage it. Um, which is just a few videos on how we do that. Uh, the first video we're going to go through is using, oops, okay, we'll do this one first. Um, this is actually using a Ross net. Um, this is traditionally used for foreign body retrieval. And uh, the Ross net is um, used to actually scoop out um, the blood clots and you actually remove it. Uh, it doesn't, once this, you actually capture the blood, you can't really pull it through the, um, pull it through the instrument channel, so you actually have to remove the scope um, to fully um, remove all the blood clots. Um, that's an example in, in a patient with a gastric bypass, but just essentially showing the technique of how a Rothnet can be used to evacuate blood. Um, this 
video shows um, blood clot over an ulcer base. And this is using a snare, which is essentially, uh, essentially scraping off the clot off the ulcer base, um, and essentially using the snare to just scrape it off. And um, once that's complete, you actually can visualize um, a visible vessel that can be uh, further treated. So it's always, uh, it's always important to remove the clot um, so that you can make sure that there's no active bleeding underneath that clot. But that's a video that's just, uh, illustrating that technique. Um, this one's very, uh, also very important is injection therapy. Um, you want to do it in four quadrants or circumferentially uh, to the site of bleeding to create a submucosal cushion. And it controls bleeding in a, a multitude of ways, not just uh, with the medication that you're injecting itself, um, which helps with vasospasm, but also creates a tamponade. Um, and that allows for additional endoscopic therapy. So you don't really want to use this in isolation, but you want to use this um, as, um, uh, as a, at least to help control the bleeding so you can actually um, determine what other, what other modalities you can use. So in terms of the technique, um, you want to use a 23-gauge or 25-gauge scleral therapy needle that you put through the instrument channel, and you only put the needle out when you're ready to inject. Um, and really, you want to approach it tangentially and sort of uh, um, uh, perpendicularly. But there's different injector needles on the market and different sizes. And you want to do this in four quadrants uh, with about 0.5 to 2 milliliter aliquots um, in e with each injection. And it's really important to have a good communication with your assistant in terms of the level of resistance. Uh, when you're putting um, the needle in the submucosal space, you should expect a bit, a bit of resistance, and you should be able to see a wheel um, when you're actually injecting the fluid into the tissue. So that's just an illustration of how you want to be injecting it. You don't want to be injecting it directly into the blood vessel, but around it. And you can do it circumferentially, so it creates a good cushion around it. Um, and then in terms of the different medications, the ones that we most commonly use is epinephrine. Uh, you do want to dilute this in a 1 to 10,000 uh, ratio in normal saline. And you actually do want to use a large volume. So when you're doing 0 0.5 to 2 milliliter aliquots, you can go circumferentially around up to 20 to 30 milliliters. And that not only helps to cause vasoconstriction, but it also creates a good tamponade effect with the submucosal cushion. And you should be able to see the blanching of the mucosa because of the vasoconstriction. And how it helps with that is to um, have a cause some tissue damage and inflammation, inflammatory effect, which can then lead to sclerosis and fibrosis. So this is just a video of how we do that. Um, so here's a here's a video showing an actively bleeding um, vessel, and there you can see the sclerotherapy needle, and you're approaching it tangentially, and not directly on the vessel, but just around it. And once you inject, um, it actually causes vasoconstriction almost immediately. And you can see that it can actually stop the bleeding. Um, however, you don't want to use this in isolation because once that epinephrine wears off, it will then start rebleeding. So you do want to make sure that um, you have everything, all the other equipment available to you. So in terms of the dues, um, as I mentioned, it actually is quite effective in initially controlling the bleeding up to 80 to 90 percent of the time. And when you uh, use it with a second modality, which we're going to go through, um, it actually can decrease the rebleeding rate by 50%. So it's quite significant. Uh, so you don't want to use this alone. Um, and you don't want to be injecting two different agents, um, as the risk is that you can either cause um, necrosis um, with too much of a submucosal cushion or with the medication you're injecting. And with epinephrine, in gen um, epinephrine in speci uh, specifically, um, it can cause some cardiovascular side effects, um, which can last up to 20 minutes. Um, so you do want to have the patient um, hooked up to monitors when you do this. Uh, then we're going to go into endoclips, which is also very, um, very easily, readily, easily, readily available and re uh, relatively easy to apply. Uh, these are metallic clips that are placed uh, through the endoscope channel and placed directly on the vessels or on the ulcer base, and it's by a mechanical force which occludes the vessel. Um, you want to, you, you are opposing the mucosa at this site, um, and it does eventually slough off, which is one of the uh, disadvantages of these types of clips. Uh, but there are different endoclips available to us by different manufacturers, so it's very important to um, know which ones are available to you at every hospital and be familiar with how they're fired and what their characteristics are. 
um, as they all vary in terms of the jaw span, um, whether they're able to rotate, whether it's the nurse that rotates it or whether you're able to rotate it, um, whether you're able to open and close it again, and how long they last um, and uh, stay opposed on the tissue. So they all differ in terms of how they're uh, in these characteristics. So it's very important for you, for all of you, to know what you have available to you so that you know how to use it, I suppose not only being the one um, on the endoscope side, but also being the assistant side in terms of how to fire these devices. Um, so it's important to know um, what you have. So there's different, uh, they're made by Olympus, Boston Scientific, and Cook for the most part. So in terms of the pros, um, they are relatively cheap and readily available, and they can fit through almost any um, endoscope instrument channel. Um, you can apply multiple clips in the same spot, and you can cross the clips. Um, however, some of the cons are they're not as robust. Uh, because you are playing it on tissue, it can be difficult to apply these on fibrotic tissues. Um, because they are easy to remove, that is sometimes a benefit if you haven't placed it in the right spot. But again, because they're easy to remove, they can sometimes fall off and cause re-bleeding when that happens. Um, so it's just important to know what kind of, um, what, what is the best, uh, they're best actually used on uh, ulcers with visible vessels that you can actually occlude. Uh, that's in contrast to over the scope clip. So this is actually a different type of clip, which is put, um, in which the cap with the clip is placed over the scope. Um, it's made of nitinol, and it captures a much larger amount of tissue, and it's much stronger in, in the compression. Um, it resembles a bear trap, and the way it's uh, deployed is actually very similar to a variceal bander, um, and they differ in, types of the, in terms of the different types of sizes and functions. Um, because the instrument channel in the scope is free, there are different accessories that can be used to help with this. Um, there's an anchor device as well as a twin grasper, which can help to um, target your site of bleeding and pull that into your uh, cap so that the clip can then be deployed over the cap onto your uh, desired tissue. So those are just illustrations of the two different accessories available and how the clip is deployed, but we're going to go into that a little bit more. Um, there are two different over-the-scope clips that are available. Um, they're one made by U.S. Endoscopy and one made by Ovesco, but they are very similar in terms of um, how they're deployed and how they're used. Uh, they're traditionally used for closure of uh, gastro, uh, like uh, perforations or defects, um, but uh, they have been used in this instance to stop bleeding as well. So we're just going to go through a video of how this is applied. Um, you can see the cap with the clip on it on in the view already. And you can see um, a visible vessel that's actively bleeding. Um, how you do, how you actually deploy this is that you suck your targeted area into the cap and use the suction to actually pull that tissue into your cap so that the clip can then be deployed over it. Um, that's again very similar to the variceal blander. Um, so you can see after the clip's been deployed, you can actually see that type of bear claw effect um, stopping the bleeding. So in terms of the limitations, um, they can be a little bit difficult to remove, as you can imagine. And there's special devices and actual uh, machines that are required to actually cut these clips. So it can sometimes be a hassle. Um, the Ovesco, this is well, mostly with the Ovesco. The US endoscopy padlock clip doesn't have a removal device yet. Um, sometimes you are limited by the ulcer size, and it's not really amenable to larger ulcers. And sometimes it can be technically difficult for deeper fibrotic ulcers. Uh, but because it's actually is a, um, a bear claw type of clip. It can have a higher um, compression, um, and they're, they don't generally fall off either. We're going to go into thermal therapy. Um, there are different types of thermal therapy, whether it's contact or non-contact, but essentially both of them achieve hemostasis through um, heat, and the heat induces edema and vasoconstriction. Um, and the contact devices that we have available are bipolar or multipolar electrocautery, hemostatic forceps, and the heater probe. But as I mentioned, the heater probe has been discontinued in the U.S. Um, since 2011. Um, and as of right now, it's still um, not available to us in the U.S. Uh, Non-contact uh, thermal therapy is argon plasma coagulation. So in terms of the contact probes, um, this is where pressure is directly applied uh, with the probe to compress and seal the walls of the tissue of uh, the bleeding vessel. And we use the blue uh, pedal um, to, coagulate the, uh, to coagulate the vessel. And they're available in both 7 French and 10 French diameters, depending on the scope that you have. 
Um, some of them have a needle um, at the end of it so that you can inject and apply the contact therapy at the same time, and others sometimes have an irrigation port at the tip. And they, you can vary the amount, the probe size, the wattage, the contact pressure, and how many applications, um, depending on the lesion that's being treated. So in terms of the keynotes of this, um, you don't need a uh, grounding pad because this is a bipolar device. And you don't have to be extremely accurate in terms of how you do it. You can either do it perpendicularly or tangentially. And larger probes are generally to be, are found to be more effective. So that's where a larger therapeutic uh, gas scope is helpful. And you want to generally use 15 to 20 watts of voltages um, and put mild to moderate pressure. And you generally also want to put, um, have four to six pulses to achieve the target uh, vessel flattening and hemostasis. So we're going to go into a video of how this is used. Um, I might fast forward some of it. Um, this particular ulcer, um, you can see, um, has a clot overlying it. Um, I think they first um, actually injected. I'm just going to fast forward a little bit. Um, this is where they're actually injecting the ulcer bed first. This is an example of how you want to do a, a dual modality on a, on a GI bleed. So this is um, first with uh, an injector needle. And you're going to do this in four quadrants and circumferentially, as we mentioned. Um, I'm just going to fast forward a little bit um, to the part where we're actually going to apply the bipolar probe. You can see there's still some oozing after the um, epinephrine injections, which is why it's important to have a second modality. So here's the uh, bipolar probe. And this is a contact, as I mentioned, uh, thermal device. So you actually want to be applying the probe directly on the tissue and apply a mild to moderate pressure onto the area that you want to um, apply the thermal energy. And applies um, four to six pulses. Uh, this one in particular has an irrigation board at the end, uh, which can help to um, visualize exactly where you're coagulating. Um, we're going to also talk about hemostatic forceps. Um, this is also somewhat of a bipolar device in which you're grasping the tissue or the visible vessel directly in the jaws of your forceps and apply electrocoagulation to that forceps. Um, the tissue retraction sometimes limits the depth of the coagulation injury, and there's different types of manufacturers that have these. The most commonly used one is the Olympus Coag Grasper, but there's also ones made by Fujifilm and Sumitomo, and they vary in types, vary in the, in the jaw shape and the opening width, as well as whether they're able to rotate. Uh, so it is a, a useful tool, particularly in um, visible, uh, visible vessels. Uh, this is the heater probe, which we're going to go into, touch on um, very briefly. Um, this is almost similar to the bipolar probe um, in, in that it's also a contact device, and uh, you need to directly apply it to the tissue. Um, it is made of PTFE. Um, as, it, um, as it's thought that, that because it is um, made of that, it won't actually stick to the tissues after you coagulate it. And it actually has an inner heating coil and an irrigation port at the tip of the catheter so you can actually um, w uh, irrigate the area after you've done coagulating it. You do use a foot pedal to control the heat activation and the irrigation. And you want, as similarly, you want to use four to five pulses per station. Uh, the power setting is generally 25 to 30 joules per pulse. So in terms of the complications of thermal therapy, it actually is relative, quite effective in terms of um, um, in, in achieving hemostasis. Um, it, however, in terms of the downside, it does, the re-bleeding rate is approximately 0.3%, and the perforation rate is approximately 0.5%. Um, in terms of re-bleeding, it's more likely to happen if you don't apply um, adequate pressure or, or not long enough, um, and that can unroof a bleeding vessel further. Um, in terms of the risk of perforation, it is related to repeated therapies in the same area or applying excessive pressure 
um, on that area. So that's why it's it's important to just put a, a small amount of pre mild to moderate pressure, but not too excessive. So I know it's a little bit hard to sometimes gauge, but um, you don't want to be push forcing that probe right through the tissue. This is in contrast to argon plasma coagulation, which is a non-contact uh, thermal um, thermal energy. Um, and you also are applying it through the blue petal. Um, the probe tip is not placed directly on the tissue, but actually two to eight millimeters away from the bleeding site. And this actually applies a monopolar current conducted through argon gas, which causes the tissue a coagulation. And this also, the probes vary in terms of the length, the diameters, and how many ports that are available. So in terms of the setup, um, that you can set it up based on different power wattages. You do want to have a low gas flow as you want to reduce the risk of gas embolization or causing pneumoperitoneum. And in terms of also the mode of energy delivery, as a forced, um, a forced energy delivery is one that's more continuous and causes a deeper penetration compared to a pulsed uh, energy delivery, which is more superficial and more intermittent. So this video just shows how argon is um, uh, the argon effect on the on the tissue. Um, you place it two to eight millimeters away, and it actually causes a char, um, and this can help to stop bleeding, um, particularly um, around an ulcer site or on a visible vessel. So this is just an example of charring the ulcer edges um, and uh, using the argon to do so uh, for, for a peptic ulcer. But it's important not to directly touch this probe on the tissue as it won't work when that happens. So in terms of the complications of non-contact therapy, uh, because uh, this is non-contact and you're going through argon gas, it can distend the GI tract. And there are sometimes a risk of pneumomediastime or pneumoperitoneum in those circumstances. Um, in rare circumstances also, there's a risk of perforation. Um, I think we've already gone through very briefly endoscopic suturing. Um, this is laid by Apollo Overstitch, and it can be effective for larger ulcers or ulcers in more difficult locations. It's not generally been approved for this use, but there are very investigational studies um, showing that it has been quite effective as a rescue therapy for um, ulcers that have failed other uh, modalities already. Um, the disadvantage of this is that it does sometimes need a double channel endoscope, and it sometimes does require um, more extensive expertise and training and actually in terms of using the device. Um, you don't want to be using this to imbricate a gastric ulcer that you may think is malignant. Um, is once you imbricate it, you won't be able to biopsy that area anymore. So that's just something to note. These are different topical therapies. These are somewhat new on the market. Um, they're actually touch-free agents that are made of mineral inert uh, powders. Um, the one that's most commonly um, uh, um, available to us now is um, Hemospray, but there's also Endoclot, which is also available, but they work very similarly. Um, in terms of the mechanism, they both absorb water when in contact with blood or water to form like a mechanical barrier that then adheres to the bleeding tissue, and that activates a clotting and platelet cascade. Um, the powder is applied with a carbon dioxide pressurized delivery system. And you can actually spray this in a non-specific way uh, towards your bleeding site. And we'll show a brief video of how that's um, done. Uh, but this is also a touch-free agent. In terms of how it's applied, it can either be through a 7 French and 10 French channel. Um, you activate the uh, carbon dioxide cartridge so that you can actually fire the device. And you really want to make sure, because it, once it's um, in contact with water, it creates that scaffold, you want to make sure that your instrument channel is completely dry, which is why you um, essentially force air through the instrument channel to, to get any water out of it. And you want to make sure that the probe is one to two centimeters away from your um, from the tissue, as once you contact that um, tissue, that probe to the uh, tissue, there's water that can form on the end of the uh, probe, which can then block or cause occlusion so that the, the powder won't fire. So it's very important that it's, a t uh, that it's um, not in contact directly with the tissue. And when you essentially fire it like a gun and it sprays out this powder, um, in a, on a wide surface area. So that's why you don't need to really be uh, targeting in a specific region. Um, you shouldn't supply more than three of these devices per patient as uh, the, this uh, powder is then fluffed in the GI lumen. And uh, with too much powder, you can sometimes, there's always a risk of causing a bowel obstruction. 
Uh, you want to make sure that you allow time for hemostasis uh, before irrigating with water. So if you want to relook at your area, you want to make sure that you let that powder sit on the tissue to cause that a mechanical scaffold and clotting um, and activate that clotting to cascade before you spray water on it. And you don't want to be aspirating powder into the endoscope channel as that can then cause um, clogging of the channel. Um, we're just going to go through this uh, quick video. Um, this is an example of a uh, peptic ulcer. Um, that was that was bleeding, um, and as you can see, you don't have to be really close to it at all, and you don't really need to be targeting in that area. You targeting in that area directly compared to the other technologies, but you can essentially just spray this powder everywhere, um, and it can cause that kind of um, sort of mechanical scaffold, and that eventually sloughs off, as you can see in the in the 72-hour um, follow-up, that that sloughs off into the GI lumen. Um, so that's why it's important to know the, the, the characteristics of this powder, um, as it's equally effective to conventional endoscopic therapy to stop uh, bleeding initially. And it's generally safe and well-tolerated. But as you can probably figure out, um, because it sloughs off, uh, usually within the first 72 hours, it has a relatively high re-bleeding rate. So the 30-day failure rate is about 27 to 30%. Um, so that's why it's, it generally shouldn't be used as a single modality, and generally it can be used to stop any brisk bleeding and help at least sort of stabilize the patient um, from that standpoint to get other modalities um, readily available, but it shouldn't be used alone. Um, some predictors of failure are patients that are hemodynamically stable indicating a brisk bleed or any active visible vessels that you see bleeding. Um, so that's why you don't want to be using it alone, and you want to make sure that you have everything, uh, other modalities available. So it's useful as an adjunct. So it can be useful in those, in those high-risk cases as a temporizing measure or as a, a bridging measure to at least mobilize other um, techniques or mobilize your interventional radiology colleagues or get you to the operating room eventually. So in terms of the risks and contraindications, um, there are some risks uh, of re-bleeding, which is probably the highest one that we should note. It's about 20 to 30 percent. And it's usually with that hap if that happens, it usually happens within the first 72 hours. Um, in terms of other things, these are a little less likely are the risks of bowel perforation purely because it's through a carbon dioxide pressurized system. And that's why you don't want to be using it in patients with suspected fistulae or perforations. Um, and it can, there's a theoretical risk of causing a bowel obstruction with too many applications of it. Another useful adjunct is fibrin glue or sealants, which we're all very familiar with in the operating room. Essentially, it's made of human fibrinogen with factor 13 and human thrombin in separate syringes, and it helps to uh, form that fibrin polymer to stimulate that clotting cascade. Um, it's available and it's made by different manufacturers. So in terms of the application, it doesn't necessarily have to be injected. It can be, but it can also be dripped or sprayed. Um, it does require a special double lumen injection catheter. Um, so um, it can sometimes be difficult to uh, push through a very small caliber catheter compared to what we're used to in the operating room. Um, it can be used repeatedly. Uh, but as, as I mentioned, it cannot be mixed, pre-mixed. It has to be placed in two separate plunger syringes that's reconstituted immediately before use. So in terms of the efficacy, it actually has been um, equally as effective as epinephrine in achieving initial hemostasis, and it's also generally safe and well-tolerated. However, the, the probably the most difficult part of it is actually injecting it, um, as you really need to have a lot of strength of, and muscle to push that um, glue through a very long catheter. So that's one of the limiting factors to this. But this can be used as a monotherapy or as an adjunct. And some of the contraindications and um, risks are risk of uh, systemic embolization if you're directly injecting it into a blood vessel. The re-bleeding rate is between 8 and 25 percent. And because it's made of human factors, there are risks of infection or anaphylaxis. Um, because it's a thick glue, there's always a risk of um, blocking the instrument channel of your scope. So in conclusion, um, peptic ulcer disease is one of the most common causes of upper GI bleeding. And uh, endoscopy is very important in these cases to not only for diagnosis, for triage, but also for actually treating the uh, bleeding. And it, the armamentarium for this is growing. So there's injection, mechanical, thermal, and topical devices that are available to you in the, in the GI suite, uh, which are actually quite effective in um, stopping the bleeding and, very, and quite um, successful.
Um, the key ones that I wanted to mention are the ones that are a large volume epinephrine injection, which should be attempted initially in most ulcer bleeding, but it shouldn't be used as a monotherapy. So you want to use that in conjunction with mechanical forces such as a clip um, or thermal, method, thermal methods, either whether it's contact or non-contact, um, together with the injection. And if you do have a recurrent bleed, um, there's, there is evidence to support a repeat endoscopic um, attempt. Um, but you also should consider at that point um, what to have your IR, IR colleagues available as well as um, surgery um, is always a last resort. All right, great. Thank you, Dr. Fung. That was um, a very good review of you know, endoscopic technology. Uh, we know it's evolving rapidly, and uh, who knows where we're going to be five years from now. Uh, and we are doing great in terms of time, so hopefully we'll have more time in the end for some questions. I now move on and invite our... Next speaker, Dr. S.P. Bowers. Dr. Bowers is a professor of surgery at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. His interests include uh, minimally invasive port guard and bariatric surgery, and he's going to talk to us about laparoscopic management of peptic ulcer disease and also discuss some surgical strategies for the complicated ulcers beyond the realm of uh, laparoscopy. Thank you, Dr. Bowers. Hey, good. Stephen Bowers from Mayo Clinic, Florida. So, um, I guess I'm not going to go over helicobacter physiology, but I will say in brief for those who are studying in front of the boards that the urease in helicobacter causes acute hypochlorhydria, which eliminates that acidic environment. And that causes increased gastrin level and relatively decreased uh, somatostatin and D, cell, and D cell. So you get a high G cell, low D cell ratio. And that can lead to duodenal gastric metaplasia and then once you have colonization with helicobacter in the duodenum, you get decreased secretin, and then almost everyone gets an ulcer. So that's why the, the somewhat the strain of helicobacter and the amount of urease and then the location of where it's colonized does impact the risk of duodenal ulcer. Now, helicobacter was first able to be diagnosed in the late 90s, and it really peaked shortly thereafter. But with eradication therapy, it has been on the decline. And currently, there is a fairly low rate of helicobacter in those aged less than 25, where it's about 50% or higher in those over 50. There is a synergistic effect of helicobacter and NSAIDs. And when they uh, a randomized trial of, of those taking um, I'm um, no, sorry, not randomized. It was a prevalent study of those who were found to have helicobacter positivity and uh, before being placed on NSAIDs. NSAIDs was just as likely to cause ulcer disease as helicobacter pylori, and there was an additive effect when both were positive. Skip this. So what is the uh, effect of NSAIDs on the GI tract? Well, it depends on whether there's a COX-1 or COX-2 inhibition. So COX-1 is, of course, in all cells, and COX-2 is inducible. So aspirin has an irreversible effect on COX-1 and COX-2, but it only has a COX, it has only a really a COX-2 and local effect at uh, 81 milligrams. NSAIDs have variable COX-1 activity and generally reversible COX-2 activity. So in the gastric mucosa, you need COX-1 for maintenance, and you need COX-2 for healing. So what that means is that NSAID use is associated with a dose-dependent increased risk of bleeding, and that is additive with helicobacter pylori. And I will skip this. There are also drug combinations when used with NSAIDs that increase its ulcer, ulcerogenicity. And the biggest one is al actually an aldosterone agonist and steroids. Now, the peptic ulcer uh, epidemiology is, is definitely changing uh, and that there are fewer duodenal ulcers because helicobacter is being eradicated and NSAID use is actually on the rise. We're seeing more gastric ulcers, and they're almost equivalent gastric to duodenal ulcers now. Clearly, peptic ulcer disease is declining relative to appendix and, uh, and gallbladder disease. Uh, and, and hemorrhage is certainly on the decline, but there's less of a decline in perforation and obstruction. Those uh, uh, that generally still will require a surgeon. Of course, endoscopic control of bleeding has really become the standard of care, 
and control of, uh, of, of bleeding with the operation, though, is relatively stable. Um, what we see over the, from the NIS study is that endoscopic control of bleeding is almost in a quarter of all patients, and that has really uh, relegated the operation to those who have failed endoscopic therapy, and that's what we're going to really talk about today. So in the H. pylori era, in the era of NSAIDs in H. pylori, we see that duodenal ulcer is fairly consistently about a sixth of patients, but gastric ulcer clearly on the rise, uh, and also varices are probably more likely to be, uh, you're not going to really see varices as a general surgeon. So once endoscopic therapy fails, what should we do? The randomized trial from uh, Hong Kong, and really most of what we know about ulcer disease comes from Hong Kong, uh, over 1,100 patients underwent therapeutic endoscopy for peptic ulcer disease, and there was a 1.5% failure rate. So 100 patients, re, uh, and, of, and of those patients went immediately to operation. Now, of those um, other patients who had initial success, 100 patients rebled, which is about 8 9%. Those patients were randomized to operation or repeat endoscopy. Now, repeat endoscopy still had a 25% failure rate. So you're talking about uh, about 3%, 3 to 4% total went to operation. Those operations were antrectomy, vagotomy, and oversewing bleeding. Uh, Dr. Fung really talked about endoscopic therapy, so I'll leave that. But I should note that when, those, when these patients come through the emergency room with peptic ulcer hemorrhage, it's very important to start immediate uh, IV proton pump inhibitors. And when there was a randomized trial between placebo and PPI for patients presenting with peptic ulcer bleeding, PPI dramatically downstaged all ulcers. So there were fewer high-risk ulcers and more ulcers that, were, that did not need endoscopic therapy. Now, what operation is best for uh, acutely bleeding or failed endoscopic therapy? Well, the best uh, data that we have comes from the NSQIP, and that was significant for the significantly reduced mortality with vagotomy and drainage, and that oversewing the ulcer had a significantly higher mortality. So the safest and lowest mortality operation is to oversew the bleeder through a vagotomy, I mean through a pyloroplasty incision, and then add a vagotomy. So we're talking about perforation. This is a case that we, I saw a couple years back. He was a 40-year-old male who awoke from sleep with abdominal pain was a 20-pack year smoker and had two drinks per day. He had no prior EGD or ulcer history and was on no medications. He looked sick, had a pulse of 100, had a rigid abdomen, uh, was, did not show signs of uh, hemorrhage. CT scan showed a gas bubble and free fluid in the abdomen. And the gas tracked down to the anterior uh, foregut area. So with a perforated ulcer, I'm sure everyone agrees that's what he has, we need to address not only the perforation but the ulcer and also the peritonitis. Most of these are duodenal but there are some in the gastric body and in the prepyloric antrum. Now there have been several studies looking at non-operative management of perforated duodenal ulcers. They found that Significantly, age over 70 was significantly associated with failure of non-operative management. In another study, with uh, the, the significant risk factors for failure were present in about half of the patients, and they included pneumoperitoneum size greater than the L1 vertebral body height on an upright chest X-ray, 
tachycardia to uh, 94 or 100 or greater, age over 59, and peritonitis. And when all four of those factors were present, there was 100% or uniform failure of non-operative therapy. So if we go back to our young, young man, he had tachycardia, peritonitis, he, was, uh, he did not have pneumoperitoneum uh, of greater than vertebral height, but he did have significant fluid in his abdomen, and he was young. Now, most people would just consider gram patch uh, closure of a perforated ulcer. However, it has been tried uh, definitive therapy for patients who have previously been on ulcer therapy and developed perforation. The long-term results of vagotomy and pyloroplasty are actually quite good, showing that there's a very uh, unlikely to have recurrent ulcer or any surgical treatment. So a new algorithm has been proposed for patients presenting with duodenal ulcer, and that if someone is known helicobacter negative or had prior treatment, then it would make sense to do an ulcer definitive operation, even as this British study I previously mentioned, going through the perforation to do the uh, pyloroplasty uh, and vagotomy. But if someone has not had prior evaluation of helicobacter pylori and they have favorable uh, risk factors, they might be considered for non-operative therapy or um, uh, surgical treatment with or without definitive ulcer therapy. So here's our, our gentleman, uh, di diagnostic laparoscopy. We can see he has uh, succus and peritonitis diffusely in the abdomen. So he's clearly going to need an extensive lavage. And you can see it traces back to a little bubble right at the uh, anterior duodenal bulb. OK, so I generally like to uh, put a vicral suture in to close the hole because you cannot feel the pylorus and you can't really tell if it is uh, anterior, uh, the, the prepyloric antrum or duodenum. So with a simple stitch, then I'll close the, uh, this is, I'm putting in the figure of eight stitch. So I'm, uh, I'll close that, and then I like to do endoscopy to determine, one, if this patient has a kissing ulcer, and two, is this definitively on the duodenal bulb, or is this in the prepyloric antrum? This is a 3-0 uh, vicral on a SH needle, and I use them in 6-inch lengths with just a standard uh, uh, this is an Olympus needle driver and rotolock uh, companion instrument. So now this does not have to be a definitive closure because of course I'm going to do a gram patch, but this enables endoscopy and that just gets us enough that we can get the uh, uh, scope and get an idea, is this pylorus open? The last thing I want to do is just do a gram patch and leave someone with a, a prepyloric a perforated ulcer that is uh, steno stenotic, where I would rather have done a resection. Okay, so then I've uh, placed my uh, gram patch sutures, and I found some suitable momentum. And this is good gram patch in the classic sense. You can also uh, suture the the momentum up to the superior duodenum and, and suture it around the periphery. But I certainly like the appeal of doing a, a gram patch in the classic sense. This is anchoring the momentum up before we'll tie these, uh, these sutures down to give a very secure closure. <laughs> 
And we're going to tie these down with a, a, a slip sliding knot. And this gives us a very secure closure. And it's a very uh, gratifying um, operation, particularly when we wash them out really, really well. Of course, I always like to put a Raytex sponge in to try to get some of this fibrinous exudate out. Uh, so, and then you have to put a, a, a significant effort just to get the chunks out. I don't really so much worry about the uh, things that are pure liquid. And so then I like to do generally a uh, contrast uh, esophagram or a upper GI study just to see how things empty and to make sure there's no residual stenosis. Now with uh, obstruction of the, uh, uh, your gastric outlet obstruction. Endoscopic therapy is, uh, has actually become the standard for a first attempt. And the, the risk factors for failure generally are age less than 40 or ongoing NSAID use. Eradication of Helicobacter pylori is associated with success, but 40% of patients may require repeat endoscopic therapy. Refractoriness is a problem that we face today, and that's um, sometimes we see patients who have had uh, transplantation or are on immune suppression or are intolerant to PPIs or, um, uh, but generally not because they can't have helicobacter eradicated. So there are several options. A highly selective vagotomy has largely gone away. I generally prefer a truncal vagotomy and anterior seromyotomy to doing this. And it does preserve pyloric function, but generally is not a very good anti-ulcer operation. Truncal vagotomy and drainage, as we said, is the easiest and lowest risk, risk procedure. It's easiest for bleeding. It's very good for definitive treatment of a perforation. And it's actually very good for refractory ulcers. But generally, a subtotal gastrectomy is the most definitive because it eliminates gastric and, and reduces uh, and parietal cell mass. Get this. So case two, there's a, a very young woman, a history of non-steroidal related duodenal ulcer. She had a, a refractory stricture of the upper duodenal sweep. She was initially treated with a Billroth II style gastric agent ostomy. And the teaching lesson for that is, as we know from pyloric exclusion in young children, if anything passes through the pylorus, then any gas, gastric agent ostomy will soon close. And that's what happened in her. She actually was operated on again for a, for a revision, and it closed off also. So she had refractory nausea and weight loss. She had uh, rue stasis syndrome from her, uh, from her uh, rue and y, but she still had preferential flow through this stenotic duodenum. So we can see that she had kind of a, mat, a matted mass of small bowel. And uh, I felt that the best operation for her was an open revision. So I'll just go through some key pointers um, on what we learned from ulcer operation. The first thing is, if you're dealing with a difficult duodenum, plan for that ahead of time. And I always take down the falciform ligament as really a giant paddle. And this will really stick to the uh, duodenal stump staple line, and I just leave this over to see how bulky that is, and that will, that will really secure uh, the duodenal stump so I don't have to worry about finding some momentum. I've already taken the liberty of taking down her, ruin, uh, her uh, alimentary limb, and so in dissecting out the uh, duodenum, I think it's uh, very important to make sure that you're taking the duodenum flush with the pancreas and to not over dissect it because the duodenum has a terminal blood supply. So if you uh, take the duodenum off of the pancreas and then leave it off, leave a cup of duodenum off, you really increase the risk of a duodenal stump blowout. So we're isolating down the gastroepiploic pedicle. And here's the uh, just a distal to the duodenum. Let me skip ahead a little bit. Uh, 
Okay, so now we have the the, the pylorus elevated, and we're going to try to take this uh, duodenum at a part that's unscarred uh, and supple, and, but we also want to take it flush with the pancreas. Now, I generally tend to use the, uh, the laparoscopic uh, staplers, even if I'm doing an uh, open case, because I like the uh, three rows of staples per side. And we've now done our resection, or this is the prior root limb. And then for reconstruction, I think the key points are, in someone who has demonstrated uh, root stasis syndrome, we want to make sure that we use a, a bowel that's definitely going to drain. So I like to drain it dependently into the left gutter. So that's an anti-peristaltic. And I like to do a Billroth II brawn with an uncut roux. So this is retro, a retrogastric gastrogagenostomy. So it'll, it'll drain dependently when she is lying or not upright. You see that the... Uh, the ligamentritis is this way, so we're routing. We measure out 20 centimeters where we're going to put our brawn enterostomy, then another 40 centimeters where we'll do our gastrojejunostomy, and then another 40 centimeters to do our, uh, our brawn. And we'll show you the uncut roux, which requires a non-cutting TA stapler distal to our enterostomy. So we do a two-layer closure of the common enterotomy. Skip ahead from that. Okay. And then this is where we're going to do our brawn enteroenterostomy. So I had previously marked this out. So this is about 20 centimeters from ligament trites to the enteroenterostomy. This is the afferent limb. This is the efferent limb. This is the common limb. And then we're going to do a, make a window in that mesentery. And then you always have to tell anyone who's a GI doctor that, that you've done this because uh, somebody might try to dilate this or call it a stricture or something like that, not recognizing it's the, it's the, aff the afferent limb and that it is an uncut root. This was developed by one of my mentors at the University of Colorado, Dr. Stigman. And it's uh, really the most physiologic reconstruction because it transmits the MMC and yet it's completely bile diverting. And this is something that you can do by laparoscopy, but you need to special order a non-cutting uh, linear stapler, which they certainly make. So you can see that paddle of the falciform ligament really covering the duodenal stump. And, and I, even if I'm doing a laparoscopic a resection with a high-risk duodenal stump, I'll still take down the falciform ligament and use that. And so here's her uh, post-op imaging. You can see that she has uh, prompt emptying, and you can see it's she has uh, that the, the there is preservation of the MMC and there's directional flow through her efferent limb. So in revisional antrectomy. Case, key pointers are preserving the falciform ligament to use this as a pedicle flap, taking the duodenal stump staple line flush with the pancreas, making dependent gastric drainage along the left gutter so it, it will drain even when the patient is, uh, is lying flat, and an uncut really very helpful for patients with motility disorders. I think it's very important to, to know of some, some bailout strategies for the difficult duodenal stump. So, uh, Nissen's closure. Uh, you know, this is uh, something that if you have a very deep uh, posterior perforating uh, ulcer and you have to operate to close it, this can buy you, uh, get, get you out of trouble. Um, and uh, 
it's certainly something to to keep in the back of your mind. The Bancroft closure, I, I uh, had to do this on a, a patient who had a prior esophagectomy, and the duodenum was so scarred in, and it was also uh, 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 plastered to the hiatus, that the, the, this was the, my only option. So uh, it's also good to know. But also something I learned in the, in the war is that a retrograde duodenostomy uh, can be an effective uh, decompressive uh, maneuver in case of a duodenal stump blowout. And it's probably preferred over a lateral duodenostomy. So those are just some tricks to keep in mind if you're going to be doing difficult uh, ulcer surgery. And no doubt, of ulcer operations that you see these days, most of them are difficult. So with that, I'll look forward to your questions, and thanks for your audience. A comprehensive review of you know, difficult peptic ulcers and, and how to manage them. We have uh, about 12 minutes, um, so we will go through a few questions that came through the audience and a few of my own. Uh, one of the questions was, um, Perforated peptic ulcers that have been repaired uh, endoscopically or laparoscopically or open and let's say have a gram patch, uh, does everybody get an upper GI before resuming feeding or that's a case by case basis? I, I Anybody can chime in? Yeah, it's Bowers here. I certainly do just because it, uh, it facilitates the progression of the patient. That is. It eliminates any doubt as to whether they can eat. And also, psychologically, if they see things going through, uh, it helps them on their way. Also, okay. It's controversial, but I believe. This is Julia, I'm beginner. I also think that most of these people are high-risk patients. They already had some catastrophe happening, so they may not be necessarily a candidate for a super fast track. Okay. Any other thoughts on upper GI? Okay. Um, another question that came through was, um, so patients who have bled and had endoscopic hemostasis and control, uh, anybody routinely scope them in 72 hours? Or again, is that case by case basis if their hemoglobin is trailing or going down? Um, I generally do it on a case-by-case -case basis. It really depends on how well you've sort of stopped the bleeding. You can actually, you get usually get a good sense of how well you've stopped the bleeding uh, on your first attempt. And usually if they have high-risk stigmatogens, sometimes that sort of pushes you to re-scope them in 72 hours. But usually, for the most part, um, I don't always re-scope them in 72 hours. You can really do it on a case-by-case -case basis and follow them clinically in terms of their hemoglobin. Um, so I, I don't, I, I wouldn't say it's a gen I wouldn't always say I always do that. I think it's really, uh, it really depends on if there's, it's a high risk patient, there's more stigmata that point you towards a, a re-bleeding um, that would really push me to do it. Also, if you feel like you've only done an injection or hemospray, which is not what I recommended, but if you only are able to apply those things, um, I would at that point sort of push me to re-scope them in 72 hours or sooner. So one question I have is, which I get every time I get a GI bleeder is, you know, the, the teaching used to be after six units, you go to the OR. Now, all the patients may not be exsanguinating and they may be slow bleeders who just bleed over days and require multiple endoscopies and multiple trips. So what do you guys think about, like, what is the threshold now? Is that six unit go to the OR for surgical control, is that still valid or you think the pendulum is swinging towards endoscopy and endoscopic control regardless of how much blood is being transfused? I, I don't, I think it's always useful to at least, endoscopy is also like useful to help localize it in the first point. I don't think there's any downside to looking with a scope like endoscopy first. Um, one, uh, one useful thing that I've done before is actually doing the endoscopy in the operating room. So if you feel like you're not, if it's actively bleeding, you don't have good endoscopic control, you can always then convert to, to surgery if it's on a second attempt. So I, I have started doing that on some occasions. But I, I think there's no 
necessary harm in at least looking with a with an endoscope first. I think one okay. of the, the drawbacks is that the more blood transfusion, the more liquid transplants, the more transplants, the more uh, immune reaction, and that sometimes may be something that the physiology of the patient cannot tolerate very well. Um, so I think that's those are the two things. While technically, certainly, endoscopy may be feasible, but what does the rest of the physiology of the patient tell you? Will they be able to sustain another big immune re reaction? Albeit with a surgery that may be another... Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, mm -hmm. ...attack. Alison, we can't hear you. I think your mic is off. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. And we can see Dr. Fung Eleanor also. Sorry. Thanks. Sorry, as, I did. As a quick technical point to Dr. Fung's point, uh, if you are going to do a dual approach where you're going in endoscopically as well as laparoscopically, it might be helpful if you think that you're not going to be able to be successful endoscopically. Go ahead and gain laparoscopic access. Otherwise, you could burn a bridge in terms of getting into the abdomen safely. Either that or use CO2. Yeah. CO2. But if you just get like a five port in, at least you have laparoscopic access. So if you try to get in afterwards, you're not going into a viscera. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, kill bird, kill two birds with one stone. Yeah, that that that's fantastic. Um, another question that I actually have a bunch of questions. I don't know how much time we'll have um, while we wait for this audience to respond. Um, so one problem child, and you guys would all agree, is the recurrent marginal ulcer after a gastric bypass. So how do you guys approach that? Endoscopic, as far as possible, at what time would you operate? What operation would you offer? So depending on the patient themselves, I would not offer them any type of surgical revision if they're if they haven't stopped smoking or stopped NSAIDs or the potential inciting factor, um, at least generally six weeks. And then we would usually do a laparoscopic um, expiration. And, and if the left gastric, if the gastric pouch is large enough that you can revise it and preserve the left gastric artery, um, then we'll usually just do a GJ revision and, and just make a very small pouch. If the pouch is already very small, um, then generally total gastrectomy and end up doing an esophago J. Um, not too much in terms of endoscopic management, unless it's just like a perforated acute ulcer, in which case if it's sealed, kind of managing them non-operatively versus um, a gram, pen, gram patch and temporizing them. I would, I would say that in the case of a person who has an ulcer that heals and then recurs again, there may be a role for a vagotomy, and that uh, uh, it's lesser operation uh, than doing a pouch excision, if that's your only option. I would say that in endoscopy, it's very important to take all the foreign material out to give an ulcer the best chance to heal. Sometimes you'll find a silk suture at the bond or some staples in there, and I think it's important to get those out. And if and if you, if you have someone who is, you're convinced they're not smoking and not using NSAIDs, uh, then you can try to preserve some stomach. Uh, if, if, they, if, if they have any of that, then I think um, you have to just get them to stop. I don't think that preserving stomach in someone who's taking NSAIDs is just going to let them, they're just going to form another ulcer, right? So, your right. only option would be a pouch, pouch gastrectomy with esophagus agenostomy. SP, what do you think about the long-term sequelae of the vagotomy, the truncal vagotomy, and the uh, dysmotility that it causes in the downstream small bowel over time, and the, uh, you know, the other issues? While we may be very successful in solving portion of the ulcer, we create some other issues with that that sometimes lead to feeding tubes and things like that. Yeah, but you know, if, if it's a, a question of, I mean, if you have an esophagogeogenostomy, you're most likely going to have a vagotomy anyway. I mean, you can preserve the you can preserve the celiac branches and things. I mean, you can do that. You can do that, but most likely you're going to have a vagotomy. So, uh, I think it's a it's a way to uh, 
And I've done that in a couple uh, cases and had pretty good results with uh, healing ulcers. And those patients who have recurrent ulceration that it completely heals and then, then relapses. Um, not in someone who has an ulcer that won't go away. Um, they need a resection. Yeah, and the small bowel effect, I mean, it definitely does, but I mean, we have really long-term data on vagotomy, and it's pretty well tolerated. And the, there is adaptation late um, to vagotomy. Some people are debilitated, but you know, some people are debilitated from anything, essentially. I, I, uh, there are no new questions, so I have one more question. This is actually a patient of mine. He's a 80-year-old gentleman, uh, not healthy. You don't see too many healthy patients. Um, Morbidly, well, not morbidly obese. His BMI is 35. He's got a pretty large ventral hernia with loss of domain. And he has a pyloric channel peptic stricture, which is fairly tight. He can only tolerate liquids. So the question for the panel is large ventral hernia, so you cannot get to really his stomach without going through the hernia. So would you dilate? Would you do a pyloromyotomy? Would you stent or would you do something different? He has a normal gut, and Helicobacter eradicated. Yeah, so Helicobacter not eradicated. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I think that you, uh, you know, eradicate Helicobacter and, and dilate them, and uh, you know, dilate them progressively on intense PPI therapy, and, and you know, you may let him. He may get better, if, particularly if it's not a fibrotic ulcer, if it's inflamed. You guys, what do you think? Yeah, the other thing is to figure out if it's a high metabolizer for PPI or anything like that. We've recently had somebody like that. Um, so they don't do well with a normal dosing. Um, that would be another thing to check. I agree. You go with serial dilations, and then if they fail endoscopic management, consider something more invasive. Mm -hmm. If this was a malignant stricture, would you stent them then? Let's say he was not an operative candidate. Would you do a palliative stent? If he was not an operative candidate? Yeah. An adenocarcinoma? Mm hmm Treated with new adjuvant radiation. Now no more active cancer, but poor operative candidate. Yeah, I think that the key thing with a stent is that you want to make sure that you don't run the stent deep into the duodenal sweep because mm -hmm. then if you do have to operate, it's very, very difficult. You want to make sure the distal aspect of the stent is not really much beyond the tumor, and they tend to shorten as, the, as it dilates. So um, you don't want them to run a long stent all the way around the duodenum because they generally use uncovered stents so that they don't migrate. So you guys mm -hmm. thought? Yeah. I would agree with the stent. If not, a you know, laparoscopic GJ is an option. Right. Yeah, they have All right, well, it's, uh, and they can do an endoscopic GJ also, but again, yeah. if anything is passing through the pylorus, anything you do will, will usually close. You know, so have to think, right. yeah, you have to think about that. I know it's it's 9 p.m. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bowers, Dr. Bingner, Dr. Patalzadeh, and Dr. Fung for your time. This uh, this has been great, and thank you to Steve Lamb and Munasa Cheng once again for getting this webinar together. Um, thank you, much, guys. Appreciate it. You all have a good night.